Hello everyone and Happy New Year. Welcome back to the Steph Zone channel. If you're joining me here for the first time, I am so excited to have you. Well, it is January on the internet and we know that that always comes with a bombardment of New Year's resolution content. Most of this is going to be the same old obvious tired stuff we see every year. Those long articles about how 95 or 98 percent of people don't keep their resolutions and some tips to ensure that it goes differently for you this year. Increasingly though, I see this repackaged with some new sentiments like setting intentions or those in and out lists that I keep seeing pop up. Now, of course, I want my fellow creatives to accomplish everything they'd like to in 2024, but really today I'm here to offer a bit of a contrary point of view. Specifically, I want to talk about some of the pitfalls of goal setting for creatives and hopefully offer you some encouragement for ignoring Instagram trends. Together, we're going to come up with some ideas for approaching your 2024 making a little bit differently. Let's get into it. Now, if we want to pick goal setting apart, we need to be clear about the type of goal setting I'm talking about. When it comes to New Year's resolutions, you're often going to hear references to SMART goals. That acronym stands for Specific, Measurable, Achievable, Relevant, and Time-Bound. It's really just the difference between saying, I want to get better at sewing, and I want to sew a tailored coat by the end of the winter. Some common goals I see in the maker community tend to often be about productivity or about volume. So you'll see people saying that they want to sew a garment a month or maybe knit for 20 minutes a day. Uh, sometimes people also want to learn specific techniques, improve their organizational skills, or of course the classic fabric or yarn purchasing ban. From what I can tell, the Make 9 framework is also a really common one used among makers. This challenge was created back in 2015 by Row of Home Row Handcraft, I'll link that down below, and it's pretty straightforward. You pick nine projects that you want to achieve over the course of the year. It's simple, it's flexible, and in theory, it's achievable for lots of people. However, if you go on Instagram and check out the Make 9 2023 post now, you'll see plenty of people who didn't really make a dent in their lists, and often these posts are coming with hints of guilt and hints of disappointment. So why did these talented, motivated people not stick with their plans? Really, the biggest issue that I see with a challenge like Make 9 is that creativity just isn't linear and it's not consistent. The reality is that projects you'd pick now in the January cold are really not the ones that you're likely to be vibing with in May or in September. Uh, for one, new patterns, new designs come out all the time. They're gonna catch your attention. But I think that the more important change is that every project that you do is going to help you practice new skills, new techniques, and help you work with different materials. You may or you may not like those lessons, and as you complete each project, that's going to heavily influence where you'd like to go next. We also need to address the impact of social media here. Now, you all know I love to bang on about my general dislike about trends. Look at my video from a few months ago on ignoring trends for more on that. But the reality here is that most of our goals end up being heavily influenced by others, for better and for worse. I'm not just referring to specific patterns or fabrics that have blown up. There are trends around like entire philosophies of making. Think of how much has changed in the last few years. We keep seeing the pendulum swing back and forth between volume-based challenges to slow sewing, from shopping local to prioritizing using materials from stash, and from the minimalist capsule wardrobe to the sew frosting challenge. Of course, none of these things are mutually exclusive, but they do complicate that eternal question of what should I make next? This impact is often compounded by makers increasingly seeking to incorporate other forms of social activism or environmental activism into their making practice. Now, I do want to make it clear where I stand. Making conscious choices about who you buy from and who you platform, I think that that's a good use of time. But I do think that we also need to be mindful to know the difference between messages that are genuinely useful, educational, inspiring, and those which are just honestly repackaged lifestyle marketing. It really does not matter how good the intention is behind any plan if you're not really serious about doing it. But at an even more macro level, I think we need to question the intention behind setting goals for our creativity in the first place. Do you actually want to become a more technically skilled or more productive maker? For many people, the answer to that question is no, or in some cases it's yes, but it's a low priority compared to many, many other areas of their lives. I see so many people turning what could just be something fun and relaxing and a hobby into yet another vehicle in our lives for personal transformation. There's this assumption that you should be having a consistent long-term relationship with crafting and that you should be taking concrete steps to build that relationship by effectively building your skills. Now, if that energizes you, that's fabulous. But if you just want to make things repetitively or sporadically, or in my case, extremely chaotically, that should also be fine. Similarly, 
I don't think we all need to feel like there should be this deep, intense attachment to making, where if you're not interested in your craft for a few weeks or a few months or a few years, that that's a problem to be solved. Maybe you're just making space for other stuff in your life, or you're tired, or you're working, or you need more sleep, and you're focusing elsewhere. Forcing that type of attachment when it's not there, and to be honest, even when it is there, it's probably just gonna come and go a bit. That's not gonna make your creative time more enjoyable, and it's certainly not going to make you feel more creative. For most of us, making is neither a job nor a necessity, and you know, I'm personally grateful that I don't have to, I don't know, clothe my dozen children through a long medieval winter. If we're doing this all just for the joy of being creative, Creativity necessitates a level of freedom and a level of flexibility, which means that we can experiment and we don't feel bad when we fail. Turn down the pressure on the output and just let that relationship be what it is at any given point in time. From there, the enjoyment can come much more naturally. Now, maybe you've gotten to this point and you're thinking, Steph, you know, I get all that. But for me, having some sort of destination in mind is really energizing and don't yuck my yum. If that's the case, I hear you. Lots of people, myself included, love a little bit of planning and certainly for me, a little bit of list making. If that is the case for you, I have some ideas for setting more fulfilling creative goals that go beyond output, that go beyond productivity. To do this though, you really need to get to the root of why you're interested in making in the first place. What about the process really appeals and effectively what excites you? Here are some questions that I like to ask myself when I'm considering where to go next. One. Do I want to use some of my craft time to connect with others or is it more enjoyable solo? Two, is my social media use energizing me or draining me? Three, what projects did I abandon in the last year and why? Four, when I'm not focused on my current craft, what else makes me feel inspired? And lastly, number five, most importantly, what would I still want to do if I couldn't tell anyone that I'd done it? Again, just a sample here but the purpose is to really isolate the parts of making that genuinely excite you. So you can just lean into those a little bit more when you're making your plans. The question we want to answer goes beyond what we like or even what we find exciting. It's really about what we're going to be persistent with. So based on those questions, let's take a few examples here of creative goals that go beyond that obsession with productivity. First up, let's say you're, we're gonna call you a community creative. This is for the person who loves scrolling Instagram, not just for the photos, but for the chance to actually read what other makers have to say. They're keeping their Ravelry page up to date and they're friends with the owner of their local fabric store. If this sounds like you, or you want a little bit more of this energy in your life, why not push yourself to attend some events this year? Show up to that knit night, show up to the fabric swap. Now, if that's not really a possibility for you to attend in person, you can always look for digital events. Some great ones are Me Made May, I mean, that's a whole month long, but there's probably dozens, if not hundreds of make-alongs that happen through Instagram over the course of the year. Again, the purpose here really isn't to focus on the output of what you're making. It's really about the chance to connect with like-minded people. You gotta get commenting. Of course, though, you need to be mindful about the time you spend absorbing others' influence. And I'd also want to remind people to show some smaller makers some love as well. If you search a pattern on Instagram, the first people who come up are going to be the ones with the largest platforms anyway. So, you know, start scrolling down and give the person with 200 followers some love. Encourage someone who does a different craft than you or someone who's much older than you or much younger than you. Let them encourage them and let them encourage you right back. Now, my next recommendation is for those who want to build a bit more connection between their making and other artistic interests. Those interests could sit in the visual arts like painting or movies, but it could also be areas like music or architecture, or even, I don't know, hiking. If that's you, why not try making a garment that's inspired by a favorite painting or make a quilt using the palette of your favorite landscape? To me, the best example of this is actually an indie yarn dyer. Her name is Savannah Rose, and like me, she is a lover of horror film. Her yarn collections actually feature palettes from the best creepy movies, and she has a, a pre-order happening right now, which I'm really excited about. Uh, but really, this type of project is going to open up so many potential areas of enjoyment that go beyond the time you spend actually working on it. You can browse an art museum, take some photos, get some inspiration, or even watch a series while you work on the thing that you're making. The process of translating one medium of art and one person's vision into yours is something that's really gratifying, and it's going to make the resulting piece feel so much more like you. To me, at least, that's a hundred times more exciting than, say, rushing to make something hot pink like everyone did for the Barbie movie, because the inspiration came from something that you yourself picked as opposed to a trend that was chosen for you. Lastly, I'm gonna be cheeky and put my own goal in here. 
let's say like me, you're a very picky baker and you're finding that the patterns released are just not doing it for you or you're not finding access to the fabrics that you like. If that's the case, I really want to encourage you to start adding more customization to your work. And you can do this as little or as much as you'd like. As an example, and we're gonna use, I'm gonna use an example for myself here, even though this is a bit of an extreme example. I really, really want to knit a spring top that's like a very intense shade of like periwinkle blue or lilac. Basically, I don't know if you can see like the color of my nails. This is, this is what I want. Um, I looked through the stock of like every yarn shop in the UK probably trying to find this color and I, I didn't find it. As an aside, like the dominant color right now, dominant color palette right now within yarn, it's so much, it's so much neutrals, it's so much pastels in, in like those sort of earthy tones. It looks so beautiful on everyone else. Honestly, it don't, doesn't do it for me. Um, but I just made myself a Pinterest board with a load of examples of the shade that I'm talking about. And I slid into the DMs of a UK based indie yarn dyer who I really, really like. She does lots of work with very saturated shades. And I really thought that she'd understand the kind of electric tone that I wanted to go for. Um, it took us a few tries, but we, she got there um, really, really quickly. And I'm so excited to get a sweater quantity of this yarn and really get moving. I'm also looking through loads of old knitting books with instructions on stitch patterns and different kind of top constructions. And so I'm really hopeful that I can get close to the vision that I have in my head. Of course, if you're involving someone else in a plan like this, you do want to just be careful up front to clarify things like pricing, like timing, especially when there's sampling involved. You just don't want to be wasting anyone's time, um, especially, of course, if they're a small business. I'm also looking through loads of old knitting books with instructions on stitch patterns and different kind of top constructions. And so I'm really hopeful that I can get close to the vision that I have in my head. That's a more extreme example, but there are many, many simpler ways to add customization to your projects. If you're sewing, most modern machines have some sort of decorative stitching functionality. So why not go ahead, add a little bit of decorative top stitching to your garments, or you can look at doing little bits of embroidery on things like napkins, things like tote bags, to just make everyday objects feel a bit more special. Um, if that's not really accessible to you based on your machine, there's also the opportunities presented by embroidered ribbon. I don't know, I haven't shown any project where I've used it on this channel yet, but I love decorative ribbon, although test that it can be washed, you know, ask me, ask me how I know. Um, but get some of that and put that on your simpler garments. You can use it for straps, you can use it as a waistband. There's really, again, lots of opportunities to make things feel a bit more exciting and a bit more custom. In the end, I just always think if I'm going to go through the trouble of making a garment by hand, why not get as close as I possibly can to the vision that I have in my head? Now, if I can leave you with one thought today, it's really just to kind of know thyself. The tendencies I have around sewing and knitting and fabric buying and how I organize things, they're not really very different now to what they were when I was 10 years old. I'm always going to be a kind of chaotic maker who swings kind of wildly between crafts and who probably can't stay organized in any sort of meaningful way. Where those tendencies create friction or whether when they go up against other values I have in my life, I obviously try to adjust, but otherwise I'm fine to just let myself be. I'd bet that you also know yourself pretty well. And if you're able to lean into your tendencies rather than swimming upstream against them and wasting all of that energy in the process, I'd bet that you're gonna have a very creative year ahead of you. As always though, let me know what you're thinking because I'm already excited to be inspired by you. Have a wonderful rest of your week and I'll see you very soon, hopefully with another video. Bye.